Hello, my name's Guy Davidson. I first joined Creative Assembly in 1999, where I'm now the Head of Engineering Practice. I'm going to talk about mastering generic programming, and this is often known as template programming, but that doesn't really get behind the motivation. Additionally, not all generic programming requires the use of the keyword template. The first thing we'll do is make sure that we all know what is meant by generic programming. The first example of generic programming that you're likely to come across is via function templates. So we'll look at some syntax and how function templates work. Then we'll move on to classes that encapsulate a behavior regardless of type. The standard library containers fall into this category. They are class templates. Next, we'll look at template parameters and then at template arguments. Then we'll consider what is meant by specialization and by instantiation. Then we'll look at dependent names and how this can really mess up compiler error messages. We'll take a look at the requires keyword, new for C++20, and finish off with a look at concepts, also new for C++20. Now, the place to start is in the paper on generic programming written by David Musser and Alexander Stepinov. It was first presented in July 1988, and it will take you a couple of hours to read, but it will be time well spent. The first paragraph reads, generic programming centers around the idea of abstracting from concrete efficient algorithms to obtain generic algorithms that can be combined with different data representations to produce a wide variety of useful software. So here's a simple example. This function will take an integer and return the square of that value, but there are some things wrong with it. Um, it doesn't guard against overflow. It returns an unsigned value and you shouldn't use unsigned for arithmetic operations, but that looks like a typical square function to me. But we can overload the function on the parameter. Unfortunately, we've got duplication right here. The algorithm is being wholly and precisely repeated. This is a bad thing. This is just copy paste, even if you haven't typed it. We should be seeking to operate at the highest available level of abstraction. We aren't interested in a function that multiplies an int by itself and another that multiplies a float by itself. We're interested in a function which multiplies a number by itself. The type is irrelevant to the algorithm. And this means we can use the keyword auto to describe the parameter type and the return type. We are telling the compiler, here is a partial definition of the function. You will need to complete the definition as required later. And it will do this at the call site, like so. Now, the contents of the angle brackets tell the compiler at compile time, it's up here, what the types are. And the contents of the parentheses deliver the arguments at runtime. And you might look at the angle brackets there and ask, why are they necessary? Surely the compiler knows that x is an int. Well, of course it does. It deduces the function template argument. You can be explicit, but most of the time, there's no need. And indeed, should the type of x change, you would need to remember to change that call sign. So let the compiler do its thing. Don't clutter your code with extra tokens and write minimal code. We'll return to template arguments in a moment. But this isn't the only place where the auto keyword appears in function definitions. Since C++14, we've been able to use it in Lambda functions, as you can see. This example from cppreference.com is called a generic Lambda. And again, the compiler simply infers what the types of A and B are. Note that double ampersand in the second parameter, just up there. We'll be returning to that in a moment. You aren't just limited to one parameter. Now, this looks innocent enough, but you might insist that this function only multiplies identical types. Perhaps you want to avoid multiplying doubles by floats because of the widening conversion that may happen. How do you stop that from happening? Well, there are two ways. This way here, decal type, this ensures that the function will only be called if the parameters are of matching types. If different types are offered, then no overload would be found. However, it does seem a little verbose. And also, will it scale to multiple parameters? Might it be error prone? The other option is to declare the type as a template parameter, and it looks like this. We've changed the function definition by adding a signal to the compiler that what follows is a function template rather than a function. We were a dozen slides in before seeing the template keyword. The T is the template parameter. Similarly, with a generic lambda, you can use the same technique. Lambdas have an optional trailing return type and no function identifier. So the template keyword is effectively in the same place. Let's introduce the next kind of template, 
So here is a C++ class. It's an array of 12 characters. It isn't a very useful object, really. The constructor copies 12 characters from the pointer to the private array. So it can contain hello world. Um, it has accesses, but it really doesn't scale. What if you want to contain different types or more of them? Well, fortunately, we have class templates. Now that's better. Now we can contain 12 of anything. And notice the syntax. We can't use auto here because there's no meaningful way for deduction to take place. We have to use a more verbose syntax to tell the compiler that this is a class template rather than a fully defined class. Imagine replacing all of those T's with auto. How would the compiler know what was going on? And you'll also notice that there is another elephant in the room, which is that you can only contain 12, which seems a little pointless, but we can do this. There we are. We've now got two, templates, two template parameters. And this is the starting point for a container that was added to C++11, std array. It was one of the first containers any C++ user would write when presented with C++98. And the reason for this is because you can use the bracket operator for bounds checking, which is one of the most common memory errors you will experience when working with arrays. Nowadays, there is little reason to work directly with arrays because there is almost always a better container for the job, or you can design your own. But the important thing to note here is that the template parameters are not both types. The second parameter is an instance of a type. In particular, it's an int. In fact, there is quite a bit of latitude available to you when it comes to template parameters. So template parameters can be types, and this is what you would usually expect, something like a vector of ints, or a complex number with double coefficients. No, double. Template parameters can also be numbers. And floating point numbers as template parameters are new for C20. They can also be enumerations or pointers. They can even be templates. So here you can see a class template which uses all of these. And the class definition would look something like this. You may be aware that I'm proposing a matrix class for inclusion in the C standard, but don't get too excited. No vendor has implemented it yet, but I'm just showing you our implementation. Moving on to template arguments, you'll remember this from a few slides ago. As you can imagine, it was quite trivial for the compiler to deduce the function template argument type. But what happens if the parameter is not a value, but a pointer or a reference? So if we pass a reference to an int to, fu to, to the function fn, what happens? Well, nothing at all. The reference is simply passed straight to the function. If the type of q is int, it becomes an int ref. And if q is an int const, it becomes an int const ref. And what happens if the function fn attempts to mutate q? It'll, you'll get a compiler error, plain and simple. But if q is int, int const ref, it becomes an int const ref. And it's the same issue again with attempting to mutate. But what if the parameter type is an r value reference? Things get a little complicated here. And we're going to have to take a detour into value categories. So each expression in C++ is characterized by two properties, a type and a value category. I'm sure you understand types quite well. I'm going to explain value categories by looking at the history, starting with CPL. So CPL started life in the early 1960s as Cambridge Programming Language, although it became the combined programming language when the University of London joined in. One of its developers included Christopher Strachey. If you've ever watched one of my videos where I discuss game dev history, you'll have heard of this man because he wrote a version of Drafts, which you may know as Checkers, and is credited as implementing the first video game. And I can bore you witless about this later in the Q&A if you like. But the language CPL was developed slowly and the first compiler appeared in 1970 and it didn't, get, it didn't really gain much traction. But a simpler language called BCPL, which was based on CPL, and which led to the languages B and then C, retain much of the design. Particularly, it introduced two modes, right-hand mode and left-hand mode. All CPL expressions can be evaluated in right-hand mode, but only some can be evaluated in left-hand mode. In right-hand mode, an expression is regarded as being a rule for computation. For example, two plus two. It's the right-hand value or R value. When evaluated in left-hand mode, an expression effectively gives an address, the left-hand value. 
Left and right stand for left of assignment and right of assignment. Now C took a similar approach. However, the role of assignment was no longer significant. C expressions are categorized between L value expressions and everything else, which would be functions and non-object values. L value means an expression that identifies an object. And in acute tone of phrase, this is known as a locator value rather than a left value. And there was a difference of opinion within the C community around the meaning of L value. The other group considers an L value to be meaningful on the left side of an assigning operator. But the C89 committee adopted the former definition of locator value. The introduction of references complicated matters a little. The name R value was reintroduced into the category taxonomy, and functions now became L values. And several non L value expressions in C became L value expressions in C. Significantly, two new rules were added. All references combined to L values, but only references to const combined to R values. And this rule is still in place. Now, having introduced references to C98, the language was expanded further and move semantics were introduced to C11. Value categories were redefined to characterize two independent properties of expressions. The first of these is has identity, and the second of these is can be moved from. An expression has identity if it's possible to determine whether the expression refers to the same entity as another expression, such as by comparing addresses of the objects or functions that they identify. An expression can be moved from if a move constructor, move assignment operator, or other function that implements move semantics combined to the expression. So in C11, expressions that have identity and cannot be moved from are called L value expressions, locator value. Expressions that have identity and can be moved from are called X value expressions for expiring value. Expressions that have identity are called GL value expressions, generalized locator value. Expressions that do not have identity and can be moved from are called PR value expressions. So that's pure R value. Expressions that can be moved from are called R value expressions. Expressions that don't have identity and can't be moved from are nonsensical. They're not used, you won't come across them. Now in C17, copy elision was made mandatory in some situations. This required separation of PR value expressions from the temporary objects initialized by them, resulting in the system that we have today. In contrast with the C11 scheme, PR values are no longer moved from. Now that's the summary of value categories. I would be very impressed if you could recite it back to me. So what we're going to do now is look at some examples of expressions and assess their value category. So what's the value category of J? J is an L value. It determines the identity of an object or a function. In this case, J. It has identity. It can't be moved from. What's the value category of true? It's a PR value. It has no identity and you can move from it. What's the value category of plus plus J, pre-increment J? It's an L value. Everything it gives you, uh, evaluating it, gives you J after some modification. It has identity, it can't be moved from. Now, what's the value category of the string literal hello world? It's an L value, it can't be moved from. Its identity is the pointer to the memory containing that string. What's the value category of std move x? It's an x value. The resources of the object can be reused, it has no identity, and it can be moved from. What's the value category of static cast double x? It's a PR value. It can initialize an object, it has no identity, and it can be moved from. Let's get a little more interesting. What's the value category of str.substr12? where str is an object of type std string. It's a PR value. It can initialize an object, it has no identity, and it can be moved from. So what's the value category of str1 plus str2? They are objects of type std string. Well, again, it's a PR value. It can initialize an object, it has no identity, and it can be moved from. What's the value category of p dereference m? And you can assume m is not a member function. It's an L value. It identifies an object, you can't move from it. 
What's the value category of A subscript N? This is nasty. It's an L value. If A is an array L value, it identifies an object. You can't move from it. If A is an array R value, then it's an X value. What's the value category of star P? Well, it's an L value. It identifies an object. You can't move from it. What's the value category of static cast char ref ref of X? It's an X value. This is a cast expression to R value reference to object type. It denotes an object whose resources can be reused. And finally, just for a laugh, what's the value category of this? It's a PR value. It's a pointer without identity that can be moved from. And there's a good chance that you got some of those wrong. I did when I first pulled the set together. Unfortunately, it is important. PR values and X values can bind to R value references, which is the sort of optimization hack that you need to know about. Being able to identify something as bindable to an R value reference should inform how you write your code, because it's going to be nearly always quicker than passing something by value. So let's return to our original question. What happens when you pass something to a function which accepts arguments by R value reference? Well, the answer is that if the argument is an R value, then the resulting type becomes an R value reference. Otherwise, it becomes an L value reference. So let's take a look. Is Q an R value? It is not. Val becomes an L value reference to int. Is Q dot subst one two an R value? It is. Val becomes an R value reference to std string. Is std move Q? an R value or an L value. It's both. Stood move Q is an X value, which is both a GL value and an R value. It's an L value since it identifies an object, and it's an R value since its resources can be reused. And this is why it can be misleading to talk about L values and R values in C++. The primary value categories are L value, PR value, and X value. R value category takes priority though. This means that val becomes an R value reference to std string. Now this is tough stuff, and you need to relearn it, reread it, reabsorb it until it all clicks into place. It may help to go to the standard and look at eel.is, C++ draft, basic.lval. Type deduction is really important to the use of templates. Additionally, the compiler uses the same rules for auto, very nearly the same. Now let's look back at the matrix class. This is called the primary template, and you'll notice that it has no class definition. I haven't omitted this unintentionally. Sometimes you don't need to define the primary template. Simply reserve the identifier. Now this is called a partial specialization. You can see that some of the values have been filled in. Now here you would expect some definition, otherwise why would you want to partially specialize it? So for example, you might partially specialize a three by three matrix if there is additional logging you want to apply for these kinds of operations, or if you want to use SIMD intrinsics or something like that. This is called a full specialization, and you can see that all of the values have been filled in. Again, you would expect some definition. We're specializing a class template here, but this also applies to a function template. So what happens when you declare one of these? Well, this will instruct the compiler to use our full specialization. What about one of these? Well, this will instruct the compiler to use our partial specialization. And here, this, this will cause a compiler error. No definition has been provided for the primary template. And neither the partial nor full specialization in the second and third parts fits the requirements. And as you can see, the compiler is choosing the most specialized specialization available. And there are rules about tie breaks, just as there are tie break rules about overloads. So let's fix that. We can add some definition just up there. Now the compiler will instantiate a concrete matrix class using those parameters, making the appropriate substitutions. And this is called implicit instantiation. Now cast your mind back to the function template instantiations. It was possible for the compiler to deduce the template arguments. Can the same be achieved for class templates? 
Well, it turns out that the answer is yes. Let's look at class templates argument deduction. Now, I imagine you've never typed this. For one thing, the allocator is a default parameter. So let's fix that. Now, it's transparently obvious from that initialization list that V should contain integers. And since C17, the compiler is allowed to make that inference. So this is now legal C++. And it's preferable since there is less code on the page. It's not always possible, of course. The matrix class has rows and columns to infer, which can't easily be done from an initialization list of numbers. There is a feature called template argument deduction guides. It's beyond the scope of this course, but do research it. So we've discussed implicit instantiation, where the compiler simply instantiates the appropriate template on request. What about explicit instantiation? What does that mean? Well, it looks like this. So in the header file, matrix.h, you can see a declaration which informs the compiler that there exists a specialization of that matrix and that generating it is not necessary. Simply import it at link time. In the source file, you can see an instantiation of the matrix. And it's this that the linker will use when member functions like the constructor or arithmetic operators are required. It is the keyword template that is enabling this. There are a couple of reasons you might want to do this. Perhaps you don't want to disclose the implementation of the matrix class to your clients, or perhaps instantiation takes a very long time and is impacting compilation time. So you only want to instantiate it once. Templates can be very heavy on a compiler. In the code basic creative assembly, we use this technique in cross-platform code, where the template implementation is different per platform. And we don't want to litter our code with hash if def everywhere. We simply extern the template declaration and supply the relevant instantiations at link time as appropriate for the platform being built. Now, one of the stumbling blocks with writing templates is the issue of dependent names. The errors that can be generated by getting their use wrong can be very hard to decode, particularly when the error report is far from the source. Although concepts and requires clauses, more on these later, are making it easier to diagnose template errors, there remain other sources of pain. Now, a dependent name is a name that depends on a template parameter. So let's look at an example of some dependent names from cppreference.com, your best bet for C++ reference material. Now, I've got four examples here. This last example, this is a particular interest right here. Because there's nothing to suggest there is anything template related going on. It's simply dereferencing a pointer and post incrementing some member data. The interesting question is, what does the compiler do about this? While parsing this template, it has to decide what the name is so that it can emit errors. It can emit errors if the code is malformed. And the compiler could take two approaches. It could decide that there isn't enough information available until the call site is reached. And that's the point where the template is instantiated. And this approach was taken by the Microsoft compiler until a few years ago, at which point a lot of our code suddenly failed to compile. Uh, the other approach you could take is to demand more information. And that's what we provide with the keyword type name. So look at the first line of the example again up here. T is a class. And although I haven't been explicit about it, A is a member type of that class used to provide a type for PA. And since it's a type, you need to prefix the declaration with the keyword type name. You need to, you need to confirm to the compiler that this is a type. Interestingly, if you compile this with the trunk version of Clang in Compiler Explorer and you omit the type name, the compiler will omit the rather helpful error that you have missed out the type name declaration. And you may ask yourself, well, why must I type type name? I'm afraid I don't have an answer. There was a paper published in October 2017 called Down with Type Name, which you can see at that link if you can read it, which sought to limit the number of places where type name was necessary, where nothing other than a type was possible. I suspect there are other situations where it's unnecessary, and we will find them as we make further clarifications to the standard. There is a further category of dependent names we need to amend code for. We've just looked at types, but what happens if the name itself refers to a template? Now the compiler will pass this code, and upon coming to s.foo, just there, we'll treat the next symbol as a less than sign. 
which is obviously not what you intended. Clearly, foo is not a type, so we can't prefix type name to the front of the function call. It's a function template. In fact, it's a class template, member function template. And we have some rather unusual syntax to deal with this case. We fall back to the use of the template keyword. It goes immediately before the name. Again, Clang does a pretty good job of diagnosing the error. Now, these matters relate to binding rules and lookup rules. And if you want to research further on cppreference.com, those are the search terms to be using, binding rules and lookup rules. Now, let's move on to more modern matters. Look at this code. The times2 function doubles something by adding it to itself. A name like times2 suggests that it's only appropriate for a numeric type or perhaps a complex number. But as it turns out, an instance of the std string class can also successfully and even meaningfully call this function. You might want to pick a better name for the string version though, such as make repeat, something like that. Now, how about this? What does it mean to square a string? Does it make a Scrabble board or a word puzzle? If you attempt to compile this, you'll be greeted with a small stream of error text telling you that there is no multiply operator or rather asterisk operator for std string. We want to prevent the user from trying to call this function with the template parameter of std string. We want to tell the compiler not to consider this function unless the type being multiplied can actually be multiplied. And this is an important and subtle point. The constraining factor here is not the type, but the algorithm. The algorithm has requirements of the type in order to operate as expected. The type needs to be arithmetic to do arithmetic things to it. So here's an approach you might take. It looks quite nice. In the third line, we further qualify the template declaration. And I'll just put that in there. Maybe that's meaningful. We have to lose the auto because we need to talk about the intended type explicitly. But the syntax is clear. We can use one of the standard type traits to reflect our need for something that is an integral or floating point value. But unfortunately, it's not valid C++. It's ambiguous to parse and becomes cluttered if there is more than one constraint to apply. So let's try another version. So here, the constraint gets its own line. There we are. Between the template introduction and the function name. Um, but neither is this valid C++. The keyword where is rather too reminiscent of SQL. So we substitute requires like this. So this is the requires keyword. You'll also note that I was able to substitute double colon value with underscore v. You go back there, you can see it says colon colon value at the end of the, at the, end of the line. Now, underscore v. This means less punctuation. Um, and it's valid for type traits since C++ 17. And if there's more than one requirement, you can join them with logical conjunction. Yeah, well, and. Now you might pause at the use of the word and in that example, because if it's a logical conjunction, wouldn't double ampersand be more appropriate? It's a matter of taste and style. You can use both. If you want to use punctuation rather than and, you are entirely able so to do. But I find unambiguous English to be clearer than symbols, and I'm a mathematician. You decide. You'll notice that all arithmetic types are trivially constructible, so this second requires clause is superfluous. The presence of logical and still requires it to be evaluated, though. This syntax still looks quite busy. The template introduction is required to highlight that the declaration is a function template, but the presence of constraints also implies that the declaration is a function template. Do we really need both? Can we have a syntax like this? What we're doing? Arithmetic, something like that. That looks to me like a function that takes a type, but must be arithmetic. Unfortunately, again, we have a parsing problem. How do we signify that we are passing a constrained type? Well, remember generic lambda expressions. Rather than specify a type for each parameter, you could specify auto instead and let the compiler infer the type. And we can use the same form here. Of course, this only works if you don't need to make further reference to the type of the parameter. But this is the point of generic programming. You don't need to know about types, only about what they can do. 
If you do need to know about the type, then reflect on what it is you're trying to do, because there's a good chance that you have miscast your abstraction and there is a better way available. But there's one small problem though, this is not valid syntax again. This syntax is only available to concepts. Type traits are not concepts, but they can be used to compose concepts. So here are the required concepts for this example. An arithmetic type is either an integral or a floating point. However, we can't put logical expressions in type declarations. We can only apply single concepts when we want to constrain types. So here is how you make a concept. You group together your traits, there they are. You choose a name. Ideally, you put it in a namespace and the job's done. The function square is a function template constrained by the parameter type satisfying the arithmetic concept. The compiler will now attempt to compile this source and tell you that there is no suitable overload of square available and will list all the candidates and what is wrong with them. From that, you will realize that you probably didn't want to call square. There is considerably more to concepts. Constraints can also include demanding the presence of particular member functions and issues surrounding exclusive or of constraints are particularly thorny, where you have one or the other, but not both. However, I want to discuss something rather more important, and that is naming concepts. Here we define a concept describing the property of being copyable and default initializable, and it's being given the name CDI. There we are. Of course, CDI is a dreadful name. Perhaps you've heard the observation naming is hard. Do you know what's harder? Taxonomy. Taxonomy is the naming of names of things. Concepts are particularly ticklish. A name like is copyable and default initializable is a poor name because it simply moves the problem somewhere else. What does that actually mean? Well, in this case, we know perfectly well what it means. Something that is copyable and default initializable is semi-regular. This is a well-known part of the taxonomy of types and the standard library provides this concept along with a selection of others in the concepts header. The concepts header is worth examining because it shows you how concepts build on one another. The concept stood semi-regular is composed from the concepts stood copyable and stood default initializable. The concept stood copyable is composed from stood copy constructible, stood movable and stood assignable from. And it's important to, to get a grasp of the taxonomy of types to understand, for example, that the difference between regular and semi-regular is irrelevant. These terms were introduced by Alex Stefanoff, the prime mover behind the standard template library, and he discusses them in his book, Elements of Programming. Do read it. So what we have here is a problem of abstraction. The name is copyable and default initializable. Simply restated the question, what should I call this concept? That is not abstraction. Raising the level of abstraction means traversing the taxonomy of types and identifying what the name of the thing is that's formed from the intersection of these concepts. Naming a concept after the pieces that make it up is merely encapsulation. It's not abstraction. It's not a scalable naming method either. You should expect to compose concepts in the same way that those defined in the concepts header are composed. This mechanism of composition of concepts will reveal the level of abstraction at which you are working and will reflect how you have factored your solution domain. When writing function templates, you are attempting to encapsulate a generic algorithm. The concepts that are appropriate for your function are abstracted from that algorithm. This may mean that some concept names simply reflect the function name. So let's develop a trivial and naive sort function. Now looking through this, it's a bubble sort. It takes quadratic time, so we wouldn't expect to see this in production code but it serves our purposes for this example. Now, what do we know about the required capabilities of the template parameter? Well, the while loop requires equality comparison. That assignment requires copy construction. Stood next requires incrementing. And here we're dereferencing values and comparing them. And here we're swapping values. We have an embarrassment of riches in the concepts header, fortunately. 
So the standard library has been sprinkled with concepts and there is an entire header devoted to some fundamental concepts, as well as more domain specific concepts in other headers like iterator. And things get interesting towards the end, right here. We need to dereference and compare the values indicated by the iterator, and then we need to be able to dereference the iterator and swap the indicated values. Now, this indirect behavior is supported by std indirectly readable from iterator and std swappable from concepts. Comparing the values is slightly more work. We need to invoke a comparison predicate relating to operands. And again, concepts comes to the rescue with std invocable, which is required by std predicate, which is required by std relation, which is required by std strict weak order. I hope you agree that sort concept there is an absolutely terrible name. I'm going to suggest sortable. So there we are. Sort, that takes two parameters, which is sortable. Now, this isn't the only place where you will see a concept preceding the auto keyword. I want to show you a piece of code from a C++ proposal. Now, this is from the execution proposal, P2300. You can see a namespace directive at the top. Don't do that. Never, ever, ever do that. It's only for slideware. Don't do that. Don't put using directives at file speed. Now, at line A, there we are. We, we see a call to a non, sorry, we see a call to a member function called scheduler. Okay. Initializing an object called sh. Now, this object name is preceded by auto, which means that the compiler infers the type, but the auto keyword is preceded by the concept scheduler, which is defined in this proposal. Now you can see the same sort of pattern at lines B, C, and D down there. Concept auto identifier. Concept auto identifier. Now, while this is future tech, P2300, the syntax is available today in any conformant C20 compiler. What it does is signal that the type that is returned satisfies the concept scheduler. At line B, you can see a function called a schedule. That function is a generic function whose parameter is constrained by requiring it to satisfy the scheduler concept. Now, you may have heard the phrase almost always auto and heard arguments for and against applying it to a code base. Usually, the argument for says that you should program with interfaces rather than types, while the argument against says that knowing the type of an object is important. However, requiring knowledge of the type suggests that you, have, su suggests that you are avoiding generic programming, which is type independent, and are adhering to object-orientated programming instead. Proceeding also with a concept that gives you the relevant information about a type, what you want it to do rather than what it is. Rather than specifying the type of an object, specify the concepts you expect it to satisfy. And in this way, the operation of your code base will be clearly revealed, and you'll be able to support value-orientated programming with all the efficiencies that that brings. Right, well, that's everything. In this lightning tour, we've covered the foundations of generic programming. We looked at what is meant by generic programming. Then we looked at function templates and class templates. Then we looked at how template parameters can be used instead of auto to introduce templates and allow you to refer to the types that your template is instantiated with. We looked at template arguments, how they can be types, values, or templates themselves. Then we saw ways of progressively specializing templates, and declaring an instantiation away from the instantiation itself, saving compilation time. We reviewed dependent names and the use of type name and template to clarify to the compiler what is going on. And then we rounded off the discussion with a look at the requires clause and a look at concepts. Things I haven't covered include variadic templates, fold expressions, variable templates, plenty of tricks and techniques like CRTP. But we've covered the basics that you'll need to get by in efficient and modern C++ programming. So thank you for listening. If you would like to improve your C++ with me while working on great games, check out our job site. And you can follow me on Twitter for more C++ content, as well as all the usual business that you find on social media.
Also, if you enjoyed this presentation, I wrote a book during lockdown with Kate Gregory, which you can buy from Amazon or Informit. Many thanks. Cheers.